It's spring, 1961. I'm five, verging on six, and I'm nestled among shopping bags in the back seat of the family's 1958 two-tone Aqua Bel Air, feeling pretty good. For once, I have my mother all to myself. There's a package of Oreos nearby, and we're heading home. Then, just to pass the time, I ask why my aunt, who was married the week before, has moved out of my grandmother's house. I used to walk across our yard to visit her, but now she's in Long Island, which seems like a galaxy away. My mother says, because that's what happens when you get married. Until this moment, I'd been planning to marry my best friend from kindergarten, Brian, but this information changes things. <laughs> I'm not getting married, I say. You'll change your mind, says my mother, even if you don't. You'll get big and want to be on your own. My chest flutters the way it does even now when things are slipping away from me. It's like hordes of moths are flying around, trapped inside my ribs. I don't know what to think. My mother is usually the last word on every subject, but she's wrong about this, and I tell her so. I'm going to stay with you and Daddy, always. She laughs, but there is a hardness to her laugh that I don't understand. You'll see, you won't want to be with Daddy and me. But I don't want to be all alone. I look for her eyes in the rear view, but her cat eye sunglasses aim straight ahead. She shrugs. Her words shoot from her mouth straight into my heart. You come in alone, you go out alone, honey. She doesn't sound like my mother anymore. I want my mother back, and I want this woman to go away. In where? Out where? The words are out of my mouth before I realize I don't want to know. But it's too late. I sit helpless in the back seat while she explains exactly what she means. No one can be born for us. No matter how many people are surround us, nobody can live for us. And someday she and I are each going to die, and no one's coming along for the ride. But don't worry, she says, trying to turn back into my mother again. It'll be a long time before that happens, and it won't seem so scary then. Now, it's June 1970. I'm counting the days until my 14th birthday, and being alone can't happen soon enough. But my mother has informed all five of us kids that we will be leaving the mountains of New Hampshire to spend six weeks at the beach just south of Boston. She has saved all winter long for the rent money and told my dad it wouldn't cost any more to feed us there than here. All he'll have to do is show up on weekends, my mother tells him, adding, if you can find the time to be with your own family. I argue that I'm old enough to stay behind with my dad, but please, my, but my please, bounce off her like hail off the roof of her getaway car, our giant green Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser <laughs> station wagon. My father's no help. The only thing that he apparently considers worse than my mother bailing on him for the summer is the thought of supervising a teenage daughter when he's at work all day. My mom starts packing the station wagon as if she's planning to open a convenience store when we arrive at the beach. Everything from hamburger helper and toilet paper to linens and spaghetti pots fill the, U fill the car. A U-Haul arrives for the bikes, the suitcases, books, more food. On the day of departure, she adds the cat, all five of us kids, and the aquarium containing our two gerbils. <laughs> Against my protests, she lets my youngest brother have the shotgun seat because he doesn't just get car sick, he gets spectacularly exorcist level car sick. <laughs> a skill he demonstrates twice during the nine and a half hours it takes to get to Massachusetts. We are slowed by construction, bathroom breaks, rush hour traffic, and the shattering of the aquarium, which sends the rodents streaking through the car in an effort to escape the cat. <laughs> Despite all of this, my mother stops to buy a television. And, and, and inside the store, inside the store, Something interesting happens. After hours of grim looks, my mother smiles. She smiles at a salesman as if he's the first good thing she's laid eyes on all day long. He smiles back. Then she produces an ad clipped from last week's Boston Globe. Just $80 for a new black and white TV. He shakes his head, tells her they're out of that particular model, but for a few more dollars, she can have a color model at a great price. She fans 80 bucks in cash and asks how he'd like to be stuck in a house on a rainy day at the beach with five kids and no TV. I watch how she makes him a co-conspirator, how she smiles it in a way that skates up to the edge of flirting, but how she also looks him dead in the eye the whole time with a flicker of warning that we know means not to test her. 
I've never seen her look at my father like that. I've never seen her look like that at another adult. The man gives up and agrees to sell her a black and white TV for the 80 bucks. Not only does he agree to sell her the television, but he agrees to carry it out to the car. I watch his grin fade when he comes to understand that if he wants this sale, he'll have to find a way to fit the television in a car already fit, filled with the contents of a small house. Not to mention the gerbils cowering in a cardboard box guarded by my little sister, who is staring at the cat and everyone else, including him, with murder in her eyes. <laughs> my mother's skin shines with sweat in the late June heat, but she continues to smile while he unboxes the television so he can jam it in somewhere. She is silent. Her eyes flick from the man to us, then to the car, and then to some point in the distance, maybe the 60 miles that lie between here and the beach, maybe further. I want to understand everything about this trip and this moment, but all I understand is that the woman I thought I knew, who was in charge of my life, has changed. I'm mesmerized, but I'm not sure I like it. When my parents divorce five years later, I think I finally understand this trip was a trial run. In the summer of 1981, I'm the mother. I'm at the wheel of a hand-me-down brown pinto wagon driving the last stretch of road from New Jersey, where I live now, to my mother's house in northern New Hampshire. My six-year-old son is in the back seat. After seven hours, we're both sick of the car. I'm out of creative ways to keep his mind from the question, how much longer now? Hours mean years to him. Minutes might as well be hours. When he asks for what feels like the hundredth time, I say, okay, okay, let's talk about something else. So he says, I know why parents get divorced. Frantic wings fill my chest. You do, I say, because of kids. The wings batting against my ribs go wild. I want to stop the car, but the road is too narrow to pull over. Part of me has been fearing this moment for a long time. I tell him it's never the kid's fault. I search the rear view. I need to see his face. He says nothing. Frantically, I tell him that parents are big enough to make their own mistakes, but all the fights I had with his father while we were together, and the ones we have now replay in my head. Fights about babysitting, feeding times, diaper changing, child support, showing up when it's visiting day. So many other fights that have nothing to do with our kid, yet center around him. Use his needs as weapons in our war over whose fault it is that our lives have come apart. My son, standing in the back seat alone, his seat belt unbuckled, finds my eyes in the mirror. He tells me about the times he hears daddy and me fighting and that he hears me in the bathroom afterwards crying. My effort to protect him has failed. I want to explain. I use many words, but none of them is the right one. I see him look out the window. There is so much more I want and need to say, but he brushes my words away with a wave of his small hand. It stings more than a slap. Then he says, how much longer now, Mom? <laughs> Flash forward to October 1986. Now my son's 11. We're in a used blue Mercury Lynx, vintage unknown, and I'm driving while angry. I'm not just angry. I'm grieving the end of a relationship that never had a future. I'm punishing myself for refusing to look squarely at that fact right from the start. I'm furious that I gave up the little control I had in the very beginning, the ability to stop the affair before it started. I am in withdrawals from a man whose touch I still feel on my skin, whose scent I can still summon at will. I'm at the wheel of a rusted out car that I hate, headed for a wedding, goddammit, a celebration of love, and all I've gotten wrong so far. I want to go and go and go, but there is a toll booth at the entrance to the Garden State Parkway and I have to stop. I hurl the change into the wire basket and hit the gas. The next thing I hear is my son's voice shouting, Mom, like he's in danger. Then comes the crack of splintering wood, the remains of the black and white toll booth gate cartwheel across the median and out into the middle of the northbound lanes. We slow just enough to watch the pieces skid to a landing near the double yellow lines. Then I hear myself say, I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> Yeah, my, uh, my son sits mute, his eyes wide. He is looking at me as if he's never seen me before. His mouth moves, 
trying to form words I'm not yet ready to hear, ask questions I'm not ready to answer, I hit the gas. August 2011. My son is now 36 and it's his turn at the wheel. He, his dog, and his battered black Dodge, black Dodge pickup are waiting for me when I arrive at the Grand Junction Airport. I've flown in for a visit. It's been eight or nine months since I've seen him, and during that time, he nearly died from an infection. I can tell he needs sleep. His business is growing faster than the number of people who can do the work. He dreads, yet expects, the moment I'll start in with the questions and concerns about how he's feeling, how he's doing, and he fends off the moment with small talk and by answering his phone every time it rings. I always feel the years my son and I have spent apart most acutely in the first few hours of a visit. This is when it feels as though there are four of us, not two. This is, there is the woman I am when I am not with him, and there is his mother. There is the man he is when we're not together, and there is my son. It makes for some jostling some false starts. He keeps one hand on the wheel and the other on his phone, which rings every few minutes as his truck rumbles through another August evening on the western slope of Colorado. Warm evening air rushes in the wide open windows of the truck. Reggae rushes out. Hoover, his basset hound, rests his heavy head in my lap. The not mother part of me loves this. I love the heat, the music, the absence of demands. I don't pay attention to the phone calls. The problems on the other end of the line are his to solve, not mine. I just want to be here, going along for the ride. I feel a sense of detach detachment that is liberating. Then I glance at my son and notice the circles under his eyes. The mother part of me rushes back in. I want to reach over and grip his hand the way I used to do when he was small, and I believed that I was the one who stood between him and everything that could harm him but I don't. It's too late for that. I know this because he never told me how sick he was until the worst part was over. I learned from a phone call with his girlfriend 10 days after she'd first gotten him to the hospital. When she couldn't lift him, she just found a friend who could. They texted me, they sent emails with bits and pieces of news about progress and setbacks. They carried on outside my field of vision as they've been doing in matters large and small for years now. The sense of detachment returns, stronger. The truck rolls forward down I-70, but I'm not noticing much. I find myself examining this detachment strand by strand. I find acceptance, relief, loneliness, and joy. Or more accurately, a lightness, the kind I once felt at the top of a zip line platform when there was no turning back and only a long drop before me. I look at my son's profile. His phone has gone silent, and for the moment, so has he. I feel the question rising through me. I want to ask if he's ever felt this way, ever experienced for even a moment what it is like to feel so close to another person, yet so very separate and ultimately alone. Then that familiar feeling in my chest stops me. For a few seconds, I'm five again, and my mother is teaching me what happens when I ask for answers I may not be ready to hear. I say nothing. My son keeps his foot on the gas pedal, and we head into the night together, alone. That is